All right. Well, welcome everyone to Let's Talk Markets with Dave Lauer. I am your co-host, Pink, and today we are back with a, we're back by popular demand with this one. This was our most popular YouTube episode, AMA Part 1, with John Wellborn, so we are very happy to welcome him back. He is a senior lecturer at Dartmouth College in economics and mathematics. He provides expert consulting and analysis on matters related to short selling, options trading, and trade settlement. So, John, thank you so much for joining us again today. It's great to be back. And I want to say, I'm I'm really disappointed to report this to you. I scoured the internet that I thought I knew and loved like my right hand, and I could not find Howard Stern scores. Uh, the 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 whole like him buying it out and direct register it. Like I I couldn't find anything oh, no. on him <laughs> trying to buy out the strip club. All I got was a lot of uh, unnecessary reporting on his doings inside of the strip club. So <laughs> I was gonna say nobody yeah. doubts he tried to buy out the strip club. That's yeah. That's not, that's, like that's not what I meant. I didn't mean on the floor. I didn't mean he put the money on the floor. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of those things where they that's uh, there's some probably some in, intelligence community term for that where it's a topic that you can never find the truth about because the search terms are too toxic. So it's buried under layers of garbage that you never peel to the layers yeah, of the Yeah, good luck searching Howard Stern strip club. I'm pretty sure he tried to buy it one dollar at a time. <laughs> yeah, yep. Yeah. That he did. So uh, so it's lost to the sands of time, and I hate to report that. Maybe one day I'll be able to share a clip with you of from some you know lost media site right maybe i can assign a dartmouth research assistant to that although they <laughs> i might not keep my job very much better longer. watch out on that one yeah yeah i think, I think these i'm the nice as it is so. <laughs> that's how you get the, the criminal justice students involved you know <laughs> yeah exactly right <laughs> or worse <laughs> All right. Well, last time it was all about FTDs and naked shorts, and you guys wanted to hear more. So we are back with more. The word of the day today is rehypothecation. What is rehypothecation? Well, rehypothecation, the, the phrase, so just to, to set the stage here, the, um, the world of securities finance is a world of collateralized lending. So this isn't, these aren't credit cards. These aren't, uh, um, other types of loans that people just give you money in exchange for a promise to repay because they think that your credit score is good enough. This is a world where collateral matters and collateral quality matters. So rehypothecation and basic hypothecation is first of all connected with how you get money. And most, a way to save, you know, a lot, and this actually goes back, if you even read Jesse Livermore, I have Jesse Livermore's book on my shelf here, um, memories of stock uh, of a stock operator. Memoirs of a stock of operator is, is even better, actually. Is it? I'll have yeah. to get the new edition of that. Yeah, yeah. But they talk about trading on margin, which is basically trading on capital from the exchange. They called it the money post in those days. Just you go to the money post, and the money men would front you the capital you needed to trade. But hypothecation refers to the idea that you post collateral and you get cash for that. So, say you want to buy securities, you want to buy something else. If you, if you already have stock in an account, you can post that stock as collateral for a loan. Typically, in, 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 a mar in any margin agreement with any margin account, most of us have margin accounts, um, you sign an agreement up front, a, a, a rehypothecation agreement. So in a typical example, I'm an account holder, uh, whether I'm a retail investor or even a hedge fund, I have these securities in an account. If I want to borrow against those securities, I sign this rehypothecation agreement. My broker, typically a bank, will give me cash based upon the notional value of those securities that I posted as collateral. That's hypothecation. Rehypothecation is when that broker dealer or that bank take those securities and do something with them. They rehypothecate them. They can use those as collateral their own collateral, they basically reuse that, recycle that collateral to get access to capital somewhere else. Or I think more commonly, they lend them out. They lend them to, their, to other clients for the purpose of short selling. So in this process, if you think of this daisy chain, account holder A has deposited securities in, in margin account A. Those securities have been used as the foundation for a loan to A. But then those securities are then lent by your broker to somebody else, person B, for the purpose of a short sale. 
and then maybe and then sold on to a new beneficial owner. And that process, you can imagine, can be repeated to a certain extent and create more beneficial owners just upon the one beneficial owner. There's also the theory that sometimes brokers use that same, the original pot of securities for the purpose of locates and lending multiple times to multiple different hedge fund clients, uh, which is, so, so those are two different ways of imagining uh, how you can have multiple short sales based upon one original pot of securities. And do you think it could be all of the above, right? So they, they're using it for locates. Um, they're also lending it that those lent securities are sold to someone else. And then their broker takes them. Right. And does it all over again. And this yes. is what, what you, what you've called chain lending. Chain lending. Yeah, I absolutely, absolutely right. Dave. I think it can happen. All of the above can happen. And, and the thing, the, the wall street defense of these practices, to the extent they are defense is most securities are easy to borrow. So it doesn't matter. We have a reasonable belief that we could locate securities prior to settlement. Therefore we're covered legally. And we don't have to, our compliance department doesn't have to worry about whether these are bona fide locates because most, the vast majority of securities are easy to borrow. And that's probably a true statement. Um, the problem is the the 5% that aren't where you get lots of crazy stuff happening. Do, do you think there's a limit to the number of times like one share can be used in, in this way? Uh, the the only limit you know in, in in economics economics is the dismal science because economics is the language of constraints so economics we talk about goods are by definition goods are scarce there is a supply curve and the scarcity of goods imbues them with value this the our securities markets on the other hand are built upon the notion that whatever the paper number of shares outstanding is the denominator on paper that is a sufficient that determines the value of the security and any trading that happens subsequently is irrelevant mm -hmm. so it doesn't matter i guess the answer to your question is theoretically no and theoretically the regulators don't care because they the efficient market hypothesis tells them it doesn't matter. The same pot of securities can be lent, but that doesn't affect the denominator in the math equation. Uh, the market's going to discover the fair price of the asset anyway, regardless of how much trading happens on a daily basis. That's their defense. I don't necessarily believe that, but right. that's it's the defense a, that they, that they must. Silly, it's such a silly defense, right? Because like the market value, price discovery, the price discovery mechanism is based on supply and demand. Absolutely. And Absolutely. And, the, and it, it also assumes that you that there's no feedback as, as as soros the most famous you know one of the most famous traders in history would say markets reflects it their feedback right. effects right. he built his entire career as a trader on the reflexivity of markets there is certainly a reflexive effect if you can just push the price around in the short term that has a feedback effect upon the demand function for these assets and that's certainly what happened in the case of a lot of these threshold securities yeah, we've actually we've actually pointed out to regulators in the past that often, especially in the rule proposals, they fail to account for reflexivity. In market, oh, yeah. Right? You, you. you should cite Soros's book. That would be- I guess so, yeah. <laughs> well, by that Definitely. logic, why would we not just allow counterfeit money to circulate? I mean, wouldn't that logic apply, apply the same to the dollar? We've only issued so many dollars. That's that, that logic doesn't apply anywhere else. So why does it apply here? Well, that's a very interesting, by, by the way, I, I'm saying this to you now because I was at a meeting at the SEC across the table from their chief economist who pulled me out of a meet after the meeting. We, we had gone into the meeting to say there's all this naked short selling happening. There are hundreds of companies in the threshold list. They've been on for hundreds of days. And he pulled me aside afterward and said to me, naked short selling doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much trading happens in these securities as long as the number of shares, the denominator doesn't change, shares issued and outstanding, um, the, the market price is fair. What a, what a crazy thing. I mean, like, the, what does it matter that the shares <laughs> outstanding hasn't changed if the shares that are trading 
Are, are no, it, it is a bizarre them? argument, and that. But this, you know, this is the this is where ideology and perhaps, um, uh, you know, I honestly don't know if he really believed it. Maybe at the time he really did believe it. Uh, he since left the SEC and went into private practice, representing the firms that he was regulating um, as an as an economist in private practice. So I don't know if he really believed it or not. I think what the SEC honestly believes is that first of all, these are corner cases. Um, as I said to you all last time, I was at a meeting at, at, at the SEC with a very senior person who said, we don't regulate for the corner cases. Right. They really believe these are corner cases. They also, and this is also true, they believe that there aren't enough short sellers helping them uncover frauds in the market. They sort of see these short sellers as bounty hunters assisting them. A lot of this is the 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 thought that came after the Enron Jim Chanos days Chanos was hailed as a hero yeah. he and Bethany McLean for having broken the Enron story and so the SEC thought that they were simply outmatched and they needed short sellers out there uncovering all the frauds that are happening like Netflix and Chipotle oh my God these terrible frauds they should be on the the threshold list for hundreds of days these right. these uh, terrible companies that nobody uses today yeah you, John John sent over some some data before this and and we'll we'll maybe if if we've got it uh, handy we'll we'll throw some of this this data up but um, you you looked at um, historical uh, threshold list appearances and Absolutely. how many days some stocks have been on threshold and well uh, maybe i should say how many years some stocks have been on the threshold list and we talked last time about what that means that there were a, generally speaking a, the failures to deliver were over the threshold something like 0.5 percent of the float is that right right um, to so to so to qualify for this threshold list you have to have fails not over half a percent of the float, but then they also have to persist for five days at the clearing corporation. So that's the key thing. So if you're on there for three days and you come off, you'll never appear in the threshold list. You have to stay there for five days and then you go on this, this, this list of, of stores. And, and, and some of these companies are, like you said, Netflix is, was on there for two, almost two years. Absolutely. Netflix, Chipotle. um, Krispy Kreme, Chipotle. Some, of the, some of the most delicious fast food out there. <laughs> Krispy Kreme was on for 640 days. Uh, Lazy Boy, 586. Chipotle, 544 days. I don't know about it, you. I love sitting in a recliner eating donuts. There you what are, are short sellers <laughs> doing attacking these companies? Right. They're I'm sure they do America. too. This is terrible. They're attacking America. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, the, the interesting thing about the threshold list is they don't make it easy to get the data. So they have, they post it. I think we talked last time about how the fails data, technically those are owned by DTCC. And so the SEC argued that they had difficulty providing this to us. We, they, they had to get special permission and now we're lucky to have the fails data. Well, the threshold list data is the exchange data. So the it's and I should say it's the listing exchange data. So not the trading exchange, it's the listing exchange. Mm -hmm. And there are technically five that are post this. The the big ones to focus on are NYSE and NASDAQ. But the NASDAQ data, to get I'm sorry, to get the NYSE data, you have to write a special script to web scrape because they don't allow you to bulk download it. The NASDAQ data you can at least bulk download. But the NYSE data, you can't. You have to ha write special script in Python or some language to be able to scrape all these text files. And even then, they have memory hold the files pre-2007 and before. So it was fortunate that I have those in my records to get the 2007 files. But they make it very, very hard to get these these historical lists from Yeah, and, and we just talked about the companies, the ETFs. It's, it's just insane. I right. mean, it's, it's honestly staggering. Years and years of threshold list appearances. And of course, XRT is the big winner there. And XRT, uh, almost 1,700 days on the threshold list. I, as we discussed last time, I do believe that this is related to some kind of swap or synthetic lending. You know, the idea is that you can't get short. Some ticker in there is hard to borrow in the XRT, the, the, re, the S&P Retail 100. So you short the ETF, but somehow you 
you have a long position on, on the basket of the other 99 stocks. So you're, you're synthetically short that one ticker um, through this creation of this product. I'm, I'm convinced that's what's going on here. Um, otherwise, why would it happen? What's especially weird is that the SEC has, is so silent about ETFs on the threshold list. Um, I mean, yeah, it was, agreed. if you go back in time, this period of 05 to 08, which was the pregnant moment for a lot of this change, um, there were lots of people yelling about all the hundreds of tickers on the threshold list. Um, but now the, ET, the SEC has just been very, very silent since 2009. They have no interest in resolving this matter, uh, sadly. It's interesting that the, there's a really fundamental difference on the charts that you've put together between NYSE and NASDAQ post great financial crisis that you, you see a far lower level of activity of, of uh, threshold counts on NASDAQ post 2009. Whereas NYSE, you know, yeah, maybe since 2017 on average, it's been a little lower, but it looks very noisy to me and it, and it looks yeah. like it stayed pretty similar, you know, in the same general range. No, I agree with that. Was you see that very, very dr steep drop in the Nasdaq because that was where all you had the growth companies. This was the the post dot com shakeout that happened, um, and it went down to the slow burn in the twenty to thirty tickers per day. Uh, whereas you're absolutely right, Nisey has been more volatile, higher ranging over that same period. Not as dramatic a change. I just I can't account for this. I I think one of the you know, I, I benefit now in hindsight because I had worked so closely with um, the Overstock people who were very active in this area. But, you know, I, and I mean this very sincerely, if they hadn't done what they did, and particularly Jonathan Johnson, who was the general counsel uh, that I work with very closely, um, I'm not sure a lot of progress would have been made on these issues. And ever since the Overstock case resolved, there has not been a, vo a company out there that is vocal, an issuer being direct, being vocal, communicating directly with the SEC. I think that's what was novel about the process. And I really think that it's it's fair to say the Overstock people deserve credit for a lot of the change that occurred in this area, particularly in eliminating the market maker exception uh, when it was so obvious that it was being abused. So yeah, I, I do wanna talk about Overstock in a bit. I, I wanna ask you a couple questions though, sticking sure. with rehypothecation for a minute. Um, we got one question. Uh, what what role do you think direct registration could play in affecting the amount of rehypothecation, if any? You know, uh, for example, like GameStop, something like a quarter of the float has been directly registered. Um, do, does that have an impact on brokers' ability to rehypothecate and chain lend, or is it doesn't matter because they can just take a small amount of shares and turn it into, you know, this crazy chain. Right. Um, you know, the, the, the short answer is, <laughs> I don't know. I, the back, yeah. I, I will tell, if you mind, can I give a little bit of history about how we got here? Sure. So, um, and I know I mentioned last week, this, the paper, the last time we talked, the paper crisis, in the 1960s. Oh, I, and I did want to ask that about that. Did, as a quick aside, did you see the, that Tennessee hearing? um about the universal commercial code changes they were going to make oh no tell me about that okay all right so as let's let's go on a on a tangent for a second because uh we, we did an episode of this uh, last week um where tennessee made some changes to uh to their laws around um exceptions for bankruptcy um priority so uh, what they have is if you have a margin account or you've lent your securities out and the broker declares bankruptcy, the creditors have priority in a bankruptcy over you, the owner of the owner of those entitlements. Um, and uh, they changed that in Tennessee to say, no, the, the investor has priority in a bankruptcy over creditors. And uh, David Webb, I think was pushing for it. And he testified um, to start that hearing. And he talked about the paperwork crisis and 
the idea that, well, one, he said this, it was actually, um, and I, maybe I saw this in a different one of his videos, but he said that it was actually the CIA, someone from the CIA that founded the, D, the DTCC. Um, and he had just barely been separated, separated from the CIA. But he also made this point that like, that actually the paperwork crisis um, where I, oh, I had this, your slide up on this, uh, because it was so good that the, the paperwork crisis from uh, 1967 was something where they had to ex close the exchange every Wednesday uh, for six months, I think. And then he said, then, but, but then it was over. Like they actually got past it, but that didn't stop them from creating the DTCC. And then many years later, using the paperwork crisis as justification for dematerialization, um, where it really wasn't a compelling reason. It was just something they could point to, but it was over at that point. Yeah, never let a good crisis go to waste. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and that's fascinating. I, I'll, uh, please send that to me. I'm, uh, I'm a fan of David Webb and he's yeah. having a moment right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, that doesn't surprise me. I, I think, uh, well, Let's talk about whatever the truth is about what, what the sure, situation yeah. in the markets was. I do know this about Wall Street. Wall Street is a reactive set of institutions. So they are not innovative. They're not proactive. They are a reactive set of organizations. They benefit gener from very generous set of rules around them that raise barriers to entry. So they're almost never forced to be better about anything. They have to just be marginally better than the person across the street. <laughs> um, but this, the the set of somehow in the early 70s whatever the case was with the paperwork crisis it was agreed that the solution was immobilization and dematerialization so those are the two words those are the two key concepts that we live with today we we are the children we're the grandchildren of immobilization and dematerialization and they define every problem that we have in market plumbing today was these two call it the original sin of the early 1970s. And when they created the Central Certificate Service uh, in 68 and the Deep Depository Trust Company in 73, the result of this is that all of this stock, the idea was, okay, we're gonna take all the, rather than moving the paper around in hand carts, they would have these stock jobbers moving it around in hand carts, and we're not gonna do that anymore. We're gonna just put all this paper in a building, and then somebody's gonna have a registry of who the shareholders are, and then somebody else is gonna be in charge of changing names in the registry and that's going to be the transfer agent mm -hmm. so this is the birth of the registrars and the transfer agents and we have that exact same system today we have very sophisticated registrars and sophisticated transfer agents maybe not so sophisticated in certain places we have shorter settlement it's now it's going to be it's t2 now it's going to be t plus one in a few months next month that, next, next month, month. Who, next one. no one's ready for it. <laughs> everybody's ready um but we're still living in this dematerialized, immobilized world, uh, which is, um, you know, almost all the problems. And, and so to David Webb's point, the question David Webb has very persuasively argues that you don't technically own any securities. You right. own a legal right. You have a share entitlement to this, to somebody else's stuff held in somebody else's registry. And the point, he actually, the, 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 the case he brought up with Lehman, actually, I found, fascinating and i you know i knew of this but i hadn't really put it together and and he put it very succinctly but you know he said because a lot of people would say well sure fine what's the problem with security entitlements this is a great system it's working so well which you know you go on to to take to pick that up argument apart i think very well right. um, but he was like look at lehman where jp morgan was both the custodian and the senior secured creditor Yes. And so they just took the assets and your entitlements went poof. Right. And that just as a note there, uh, years later, I was at a meeting with, um, well, not leave. I was at the meeting with Dick Fold and he made that exact same argument. He really? said he knew what had happened and wow. he said that and he was trying to argue for reform of the plumbing of the settlement system. He got it because he'd benefited from it for years. And uh, he saw what happened to him um, when you're on the wrong side of the trade and it's not right. pretty. Right. 
Just as a note, incidentally, you, you mentioned the, the state case, and we, we don't have to talk about Overstock now, but I will say the Overstock case was interesting because it was a state case. And it was successful because it was in state court. And the, the attorneys who brought that case <clears throat> did so with a scalpel. They brought a scalpel and they, they pled and they argued very carefully under California state security statute. And in a way, remember, you always want to avoid federal court. Federal court is where you, you, you take decades, nothing happens. And ultimately, people will say supremacy clause, the SEC rules, trump whatever the federal courts decide. So nothing ever happens. So the SEC writes rules poorly. They execute them poorly. Those become law in the federal courts. <clears throat> so you can never get justice. Yeah. So you, to find success, you have to go to state courts. And there are there's actually association, the National Association of State Security Securities. Administrators, yeah. Yes, NASA. Yeah, NASA. NASA. And right. uh, back in the day, NASA were some of the first people arguing for market reform, mm. having great conferences. There was a guy named Peter Shepkavage, who was a retired uh, securities lawyer, who was a great, great advocate in these area. Um, Peter taught me a lot over the years, and he was a NASA administrator. And it was the states that had these statutes that were um, because it used to be there were all these exchanges all over this all over the right. the country that had their own rules, so the states govern those those exchanges. And, and interestingly, this Tennessee law, the other change it made was to eliminate the ability for brokers to put a choice of of law provision into their customer agreements. And so, if you are a Tennessee investor, you yes. have to be governed by Tennessee law. Isn't that interesting? Well, yeah. that, you know, the, the beauty of the federalist system is that ultimately power uh, returns to the states. Yeah. And that has to be. And it's the part of the efficiency of our process. And the states, state security, state regulators, state lawmakers have to, you know, if, if things aren't going to happen at the federal level, then the states have to be the ones to come in and, and make it happen. And so it's good to see that that's. Yeah, I was, I, I was watching the hearing and um, I, I really wasn't. Oh, I, I didn't think it was a big deal. And then after David Webb got up there, uh, someone from SIFMA came up and he's like, everything is great. Don't you dare change anything. And I'm like, all right, wait a sec. There's something here now. <laughs> if they if they send someone to Tennessee, there's something here. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's, yeah, that's uh, that's funny. SIFMA came. SIFMA's always there. Always. They're yeah. always there outside the room. Um, someone someone getting ready to come. told me that it's it's almost like they have a satellite office at the FTC. <laughs> um, let me, all right, here's another question we got. Uh, what does utilization and cost to borrow tell us about rehypothecation and short interest? I know these are these are data sets you look at, as we've talked yeah. about before in securities lending. That we've got as well, um, and I I thought that I. I I, I, I mean, I know, you know, cost to borrow is generally reflective of demand for lending. Um, so there is some maybe some information in there, but does, can it tell us anything? And especially, I actually think that's an interesting question. Can utilization provide any insight into rehypothecation? Yeah, um, <laughs> such a good question. So first of all, I have to say something interesting. By the way, I so I teach... I wear a lot of hats in my teaching life, and I'm lucky as a lecturer, I get paid just to teach. I don't have to go to meetings or deal with politics, um, which academia is every bit as bad as you can imagine. Uh, Henry Kissinger's line, the, the fights are bitter because the stakes are so low, is absolutely <laughs> right. And uh, it the the politics can be soul crushing, but teaching is wonderful, and I love my, it. And it, my brother in law is a scientist up here in Canada. He's he's interestingly he's a lichenologist. Um, and yeah, highly specialized studies like in, uh, and for some unfortunate reason, he's had to be sort of in a management role for the last few years. And <laughs> it, it, yeah. he hates it. And he's very close now to getting back into research. He's very excited. So I, I you know, and also the, the problem is that they passed, they passed the, uh, the baton around for who gets to be king exactly. for, for a few yeah. days. And it's a person who's completely unqualified to be in that role. Yeah. Um, they may be a great researcher, but they're not a good administrator. Yeah. Um, anyway, I say that because I've had the, I've had the chance to integrate my, my consulting work with my teaching very carefully. And a lot of really cool things happen. One of the things I'm doing, I'm actually writing a research paper about it is you can take an options chain and using put call parity 
and construct an implied borrow price. You can actually reconstruct mm. the rate, the cost to borrow from an options chain. And you can actually build a visual surface of this. It's actually a very cool process. And they, you know, just by looking at the options chain using put call parity. Um, so I had to note that because it's a fun discovery that I'm working on my research days. Um, and, it, and in general, the implied cost to borrow of the at the money um, spot contract generally tracks the cost of borrowing my data. Sometimes you get big deviations when they're weird liquidity events, but in general, they tend to be about the same. Um, as we know, you know, the utilization rate, the problem with the utilization rate is that is not, it's not a statistic I would rely upon yeah. in a hard way because it's just too noted, too hard to know what the utilization rate is. And in, in truth, in hard to borrow securities, um, you just don't know what kind of things are happening around to help customers get short. The big, the right. big firms get short. Yeah, uh, in and those you see ways. it pegged at hundred percent constantly for some of the right. period, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I think that the one of the in, open questions in, in the financial research. I'm actually looking at this in another paper. Is to what extent borrow costs are predictive of price activity, and the, and the it's a hard. It's a hard thing to know, um, but because it's a collateralized loan, bigger hedge funds, more with multiple prime brokers, get a better rate, better cost of borrow. What's interesting about cost of borrows is that there's a huge, huge range with a huge yeah. standard deviation. Right. So there's not one price. And because of that, th just that fact in the stock loan data that you and I both know, Dave, that one fact tells me that it's very hard to under the, this is such an opaque market. Um, the fact that people are basically selling the same product to different, to different individuals at different prices tells you that this market is lumpy and discontinuous and not very efficient at how it prices things. Oh yeah, I, I worked with a company years ago and, and their entire product was basically helping hedge funds maximize ROA, you know, your return on assets by moving between primes depending on who is offering the best rebate right. you know the best right. interest rate and that's a great product and the, and the and by the way we haven't talked about rebate is it worth discussing sure. or do yeah. your viewers yeah. familiar with that um so just for people who are familiar with, with the mechanics in it in a short sale a short sale is again a collateralized loan but the way it works is you tell your broker you want to short xyz securities they borrow them, hopefully they borrow them. The securities are sold. The cash proceeds of that sale are placed in an overnight account. And that overnight account typically, you know, this is the repo market. Typically they're invested in, in treasuries. And if it's an easy to borrow stock, i.e. a positive rebate stock, that some portion of that overnight return is dividended back to the hedge fund. And that's a positive rebate. So your cost to borrow in that sense is whatever you would normally get from that cash in full, less what the broker holds back. If it's a hard to borrow stock, the broker might keep everything, keep the full overnight proceeds on the cash invested, or they might charge you a fee on top of that, i.e. a negative rebate. So in addition to post to keeping the collateral with your broker, you have to pay an extra fee. Right. It's an annualized fee. It's marked to market every day as some function of the value of those securities. So if the stock that you're short goes up in your margin account, you might have a margin call. You have to put more cash into that account, unfortunately. Um, and I'm told that the way it works now is it's every 30 days. You don't pay every day. You pay every 30 days. Then in 30 days, you settle up uh, the rebate total. Uh, if it's negative, you pay to your broker. If it's positive, they give you some amount back in 30 days. So one one thing we get a lot of questions about as well is how does all of I mean what we we keep talking about the mechanics of shorting uh, in 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 the, the market in in the equity market, but how does this work uh, when you're dealing with swaps and derivatives? I mean, it, in theory, right? If I'm gonna if I'm going to get a uh, some short exposure through a counterparty via a swap, that counterparty, in, again, in theory, is going to go actually short that and, and then swap that exposure with me. It, but that, that's not necessarily 
how it works, right? Right. Well, I I will t the um, this is an area where I'm not necessarily an expert, but I can tell you when to think about the data. And I know you see this too with the data we look at stock lending. Most stock loans are collateralized by cash. That is the cash from the sale of the stock and the initial short sale ticket. So most, in the vast majority of stocks, the vast majority of, of scenarios, particularly in the US, there's the cash collateral. The cash collateral loans are most of the total stock lending on any given day. However, in some stocks, in some strange situations, in the stock loan data that, that we study, you see non-cash collateralized loans mm -hmm. that can be quite large. I have to assume those represent swaps in some way, meaning something is happening there where the fund is perhaps keeping the cash um, and it instead, in lieu of that cash, they are posting other securities or other high quality collateral um, or something else is happening that, that the broker keeps as their collateral for that loan when it's a non-cash mm. collateral. Okay, so, so. interesting. Um, all right, let me ask you one last question on this whole this whole topic um which i have gotten so many times um do you think that tokenized securities you know securities that are tokenized on a blockchain can be used in any way shape or form as locates <sighs> You mean in being compliance with current securities laws? Yes. Well, that certainly was the goal of this exchange called T0, which was started, and I, which I have no connection with and I don't know anything about, but I believe that was their goal. Um, to tokenize securities. Yeah, that's right. Yes, and, and also tokenize securities lending. That was, I think, was the goal of the process. Um, people have tried to do this exact thing and they've gotten a lot of input from a lot of fancy attorneys along the way about whether it's in compliance or it's not in compliance. I believe T0 had some approval. It was one of the first exchanges approved they to were, do this. They, they got, a, there, there was some approval in, in sort of working with another exchange. NYSE ultimately, I think, bought T0 um, or at least bought a controlling chunk of it um, and it, they never actually uh, had sort of blockchain based yeah. anything, I think, other than they, they put market data on the blockchain. Um, but yeah. I, I haven't kept up with it. So I don't know if in the last year or so anything has changed about that. I really haven't paid attention to T0. It, it never really went anywhere. And, and unfortunately, which is maybe it was bought unintentionally so that it wouldn't go anywhere. We just don't know. It, the sad thing, I, I should say maybe the answer to this blockchain i.e an encrypted database is is the ideal solution to a lot of these problems mm -hmm. of fungibility and immobilization and dematerialization mm -hmm. this uh, when i was doing research i was doing some research for this discussion i actually went back to my old notes for my phd dissertation i had a chapter about the history of these institutions and i actually found there was debate there was a huge debate in Congress. So reg national market system was 1975. Yep. There was a lot of debate. You can go read letters by the senators mm -hmm. to each other. They talk about fails in their letters, fails to deliver, fails to receive. These are terms that actually come from the 70s. And centralized clearing and immobilization dematerialization was not the only option. Mm -hmm. There were debates about having uh, decentralized immobilization about having multiple uh, clearing entities. There were uh, there were debates about alternative systems. So the one that we have today isn't the only one that was debated back in the day. But if David Webb's right, it was fated to be always. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I he think, seems to think the CIA is really competent, and from what I've read, they're just not. They're really not. But they're I really good at marketing. <laughs> I absolutely think that's I, well. Uh, the I absolutely think that the um, you know this is the debate about incompetent or evil. Is yeah, there government incompetent yeah, or is there government yeah, evil? Yeah, and I yeah. see plenty of arguments on either side. I, I also think our government. Great, 
I read a great history of the CIA just recently, really in depth. And and the theme was, man, are they bad at what they do and man, yeah. are they good at, at not seeming that way. <laughs> right. It's highly, uh, high, the government is fragmented. It's in silos. You find people in one silo that have no idea what's happening in the silo next to them. Um, so you have, so who is, you know, the whole point of reason we have a CIA was to centralize intelligence because it was so fragmented. Yeah. But then that was terrible after 9-11 revealed that was bad. So they created a DNI whose job was, again, to centralize the intelligence. And then, of course, they just stopped giving information to the DNI. So who knows in the chart? Um, <laughs> back to tokenization. It's right. a perfect solution. And, and it, so, okay, good, a good solution. But here's what people tend to allege. They say FTX created all of these stock tokens. And they were trading on FTX. And, and, and of course. They said at one point there was a one-to-one -one, um, relationship between these tokens and actual shares of stock being held, but that that was if it was ever the case, it certainly was not the case when it all came crashing down as a giant fraud. Um, and but because they created all these tokens, people say, well, they were being used as locates to short hard-to-borrow names, hmm. and. I don't see how that's possible in our current framework, both from a legal perspective, but also from a collateral perspective. Like, even if they, like, I don't think finding locates is any problem. Like I, people don't even really need to find them when it comes down to it, but, but maybe I'm mistaken on this. Uh, no, I think I'm with you, Dave. I, I honestly, I, I can't explain that. I will simply say that short selling is, to understand it, to, to our discussion rehypothecation, yeah. it is all about collateral quality. Right. So if you look at the range of prices people pay to borrow stock, it's a function of the quality of your collateral and also the quality of you as, as a borrower. So the people who work in securities finance, they're obsessed with collateral quality. Um, the other thing that to just realize is that a short sale is an overnight loan. So it's an overnight collateralized loan that is constantly being repriced. And many short sellers face not just repricing risk, but recall risk. Now, recalls aren't necessarily common, but they do happen. So they're just situations where the, the lender says, I want my stock back. Right. And you have to be prepared for that to happen as a short seller. Right. Okay. Excellent. Um, I think this was really informative and interesting. And I think, I think it goes to your point where... Um, I, I guess I don't remember if it was in the last episode or in conversations we've had, but you've, you've, you've told me that um, when you get in the room on a case with these with the lawyers from the other side, the, the answer is always rehypothecation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's all rehypothecation. Actually, and the funniest thing was well, I, so back in the day, you know, prior to the July 2008 emergency order, when the SEC banned naked short selling for all the primary dealers yeah. because things were so bad. <laughs> um, before then, there was such skepticism and derision of people who complained about naked short selling. And from the, not just Wall Street, but the financial press, there was a group called the Society of American Business Editors and Writers, SABU. And Cebu had an entire yeah. conference. I've spoken about the, at one of their conferences. <laughs> oh, you have? I didn't know if they're still around. Um, that's good. Well, the Cebu had entire conferences about the naked short selling conspiracy theories. Oh, and God. it was financial yeah. journalists yeah, <laughs> putting down anybody yeah. who thought that there was a legitimate concerns around market reform. And I was at one of those conferences and there was a reporter from the New York Post. And I remember him saying to me in his thick Staten Island accent, it's all rehypothecation. It's all rehypothecation. You don't understand. It's all rehypothecation. It's just yeah. fine. Right. Uh, which is his code for saying, oh, there's not naked short selling and fails. The system is just structured so that chain lending happens. And there are all these honest reasons um, for why things happen. Okay, maybe. But if that were true, then you wouldn't have all these fails going along with it. Right. Right. Exactly. That's the, that's right. the so response. That, so that takes us to um, one of the, uh, from a common stock perspective, at least, the leader um, in your uh, threshold count data, which is Overstock. Oh, yeah. So let's talk about that. <clears throat> so uh, the Overstock case is, is um, a fraught, a fraught <laughs> case. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be careful today. It was so this, there were two big lawsuits Overstock filed. One was 2005, 
One was January of 2007, and it ultimately ended in 2014, you could call that. So it was a seven, eight year uh, process, but in all the litigation took about 10 years. I had uh, known the CEO for 25 years. He was a teacher of mine when I was at Dartmouth. Uh, he actually led my a foreign study program to China mm. the summer of 1999. And that's how I met uh, Patrick. And um, so I've known him 25 years. And he's a controversial figure, but he, it, this was a situation that demanded someone who really wasn't afraid, I think, to, yeah, to go sure. against trend. And the I went to work there in 2005. Actually, I had been in grad school. I got very, very sick. And I had to leave graduate school. I'd been in the hospital a long time. And I got out and I had no idea what to do. And Patrick said, well, listen, we're, we're involved in this market reform effort. We've just, we've learned that overstock is on the threshold list. Come help figure out why, why that is. And so what began, really, I was a fly on the wall for this process, learning about what was going on. And um, in 2006, I spent a lot of 2006, I, I rented, a, in those days, Reuters had a financial terminal like Bloomberg. And I remember sitting in my apartment in Salt Lake City taking screenshots of these block trades um, along with these options trades. We had no idea what they were, but we were taking pictures of it, trying to figure out what was going on. And later we figured out these were the uh, conversions and the reversals uh, that were the foundation of um, the abuse of the options market maker exception. Mm. Um, and in fact, I remember meeting a guy who explained to me, okay, these are the, that's a conversion going on right there. Somebody's a market maker is creating stock out of thin air for the purpose of helping a counterparty obtain hard to borrow securities. The overstock case was filed in early 2007 and, and originally was against every, uh, everybody that had a DTC account. They got some fails data, and so they understood that there was naked short selling happening. There were fails, and that, that data became the foundation for the lawsuit. But what was key about the lawsuit, as I said earlier, is was pled very, very well uh, by this California law firm of uh, Stein and Lubin. Uh, the lead attorneys were Ellen Sarangel, uh, Dory Griffinger, and uh, Jonathan Summers. And these were not <laughs> conspiracy theorists. These were serious adults, professionals. And they understood securities law very well, and they conducted this case beautifully. And they filed it under the California state statute, involved something called conversion. And conversion is like a legal taking. So if you imagine um, naked short selling and fails to deliver as robbing somebody of their property right, at least mm -hmm. this is my non-lawyer understanding of, of the mm -hmm. conversion claim. Essentially, they had converted your 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 property right. They had taken your property right from you in some, in some way. So the Overstock case was pled very specifically under these California statute numbers. I think one was called 25400 and there was another California security statute that was pled under. And ultimately Overstock settled with almost everybody except for Goldman and the case went all the way to the California Court of Appeals. You can read the Court of Appeals ruling from 2014 Ultimately, they just, the court ruled that Goldman, um, that Overstock settled with almost all the plaintiffs, and the last one was Goldman, and the court ruled that there was not enough physical nexus for Goldman Sachs execution and clearing to be included um, in that. Because um, of California. Because of California. So they, and Overstock, uh, so there was a jurisdictional issue, not, and, but the court nevertheless goes through the facts of the case very clearly. It talks about the individual market makers whom the SEC and FINRA had sanctioned and how the brokers uh, uh, may or may not have been on the other side of these trades. Um, the discovery, and I can't talk in detail about the case because there's the very serious protective orders you can imagine in all these lawsuits. It's what was interesting about- years later. 17 years later, I still can't tie. I live in fear. Um, so I'm, I'm very careful only to discuss things in the public domain. I'm the same I way about say, a company I used to work for. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. There's a law. Yeah. Suddenly these companies start working very well when they, 17 years later. Yeah, um, right. There were, for those interested, there you can read the California Court of Appeals ruling. You can also read on the Economist website, and we'll find a way to get this to you. There was a, in the case, so this case was covered by this very serious protective order, millions of pages of discovery, you know, hundreds of hours of depositions on all sides. It was, 
it was a, a tour through how settlement work, how options trading works, et cetera, et cetera. All this stuff discovered was covered by very serious protective orders and all the filings in public were redacted to protect trade secrets. However, at one point, an attorney for the defense made a public filing that was unredacted and a whole bunch of discovery went into the public domain that was unredacted. And they tried to claw that back. My memory, my memory is they tried to claw that back, but um, news organizations got involved. The Economist magazine got involved and Rolling Stone got involved and a very famous First Amendment attorney represented them. And that also went to the California Court of Appeals and they prevailed. So there's a significant amount of discovery in that case that you can read, I think, on, at least on the Economist website, they still have some of these documents up um, where you can read some of the discovery and a lot of it's spicy um, involving the compliance department. And yeah, other we'll, we'll provide the links if people are interested in the show notes. Right. But it was, again, like I said, it was it was a successful, I, I regard it as being a successful effort because it was it was pled specific, it was very expensive. So the, <laughs> the board had to, to provide the support, approve all of this. Um, but Overstock was on the threshold list. You know, if you, even today, Overstock is the number one ticker on the NASDAQ threshold list. It was on for 922 days total, the most of any um, on the NASDAQ threshold list. And so there had to be some explanation for it. And I think a lot of us uh, there were just so frustrated that things the justice was so hard to obtain and we had to spend so much company treasure, so much company treasure had to be spent to get justice. And I think ultimately a measure of justice was obtained. Was, was there ever any, um, I guess it would be hard to say if, if everything was settled, but I wonder in, in any of your work, was there ever any estimate in terms of the cost to the company, um, not from a, a legal expense perspective, but from a market cap perspective? Was, was yeah. there ever any model built to try and estimate something like that? There was. And, um, you know, as, as all these lawsuits, there are damage models. I'm not sure I'm allowed to speak about that, but that was certainly part of the okay. case. Yeah. Um, there were some interesting, uh, very famous economists involved in that case who provided damage models on both sides, as you would expect in, yeah. in yeah. litigation. Um, but yes, it's certainly part of the claim was damages that the company was harmed and the shareholder it was a plaintiff suit. So there were California shareholders who were part of that lawsuit and part of the allegations that they were, they were harmed and the company was harmed, particularly because there were two securities sales at that time. But, you know, the whole point of our capital markets is that young growing companies sip at capital markets. Yeah, right. And that's the whole point. You know, it doesn't matter if it's Overstock or it's Netflix or if it's Cabela's or Chipotle um, or any of these companies, Lazy Boy that were on forever. Taser was a big one. Taser International is still around, but they changed their name, I think, to Axon or something. But they were on the threshold list forever. Taser was on the threshold list forever. And these are companies shocking. that were sh shocking, right? These are Taser was on for 562 days. These are companies trying to develop ideas. They're figuring things out. They're not perfect. They make mistakes. They get some things right, they get some things wrong. And so the whole point is that they go to market expecting a fair price and expecting to be able to do secondary offerings and raise capital in a fair way. And that was not happening during the, the early days of threshold list. And what about, um, we got this one question about the, um, the and I think you, you, you wrote something about this in your, um, in your presentation about the NSS and FTDs and how that affects proxy voting. Well, I mean, this is, if you throw out everything else we've talked about, Dave, every, if you set aside everything else, you're just going to say, the hell with it all, they're crappy companies, who cares? If nothing else, you should care deeply at how this system messes up the proxy voting system. Yes, um, I totally agree. The, we, we talked about Dole Foods last time. The, the Delaware Chancery Court was... The, the the judge's exasperation in the chance in the in the Dole Foods case is is visible. So you had a, uh, there was a plaintiff's lawsuit. Thirty six point eight million people showed up. I'm sorry, thirty six point eight million shares were in the class, but almost uh, forty nine people million people showed up. That's almost twenty percent extra. 
So to your question of how much can chain, how much could rehypothecation, how much, how much can chain lending happening? There's your answer. Was it, that it, reflected in the short interest numbers for Dole? I believe it was. I actually haven't looked. I should go back and look at that. And I haven't checked on that recently. That was, I need to go look on that. I don't know the answer to that okay, question. I, yeah, that would be um, interesting. It was, I, what, uh, what I don't know is whether the, the loser in that case paid extra to make it go away. That I have to check on is if the loser who was paying that um, had to pay extra or whether they just proportionally pro rata allocated the, the, the payout per share. I need to check on that as well. The judge ultimately t did what they could and I think they gave a pro rata interest to the 49 million people who showed up of the 36 to 38 that million. That that like, shouldn't it have been the short seller's obligation to do that? You would think there would be some kind of payment in lieu obligation, right? I would regard, but I think maybe that's why it was a novel area of securities law because sure. nobody ever thought about whose problem it is if right. there's a settlement <laughs> and short sellers have created a, additional beneficial owners. That's just, crazy. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go back. Um, because in the Overstock case, this figure came out that I've seen around a lot. And I'm curious uh, it, about what you, is, is this true? And, and if so, how, how could this even be true? But the, the figure is that Goldman, um, that 75% of their income as a firm was from securities lending. Is that even accurate? I've seen this number thrown around all over the place. Um, you know, Dave, I'm not sure I'm able to talk about that. I want to talk about that, but I'm not sure I can. I want to okay. be really careful. I have I have no Fair assets, enough. so I I don't I don't I, want I, I don't I, want you to, to to get anywhere near, you know, uh, a, a line well, that, that you can't cross. Let me let me respond. I'm going to be a politician, and I'm going to answer the question. I hope you ask me. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the if you go to the Economist website, which we'll hope we'll provide a link to, mm -hmm. and you see the discovery documents that were released, that question may be answered in there. Okay. And in addition to that, it may be there was a fifth amended complaint that Overstock filed with the court, but that was never allowed to proceed. So that so what happens is you get a litigation. You learn things and you amend your filing, you amend your complaint to reflect your new information. There were four amendments, or I should say there were three amendments to the fourth version of the complaint, and then there was a fifth amended complaint, which the company had wished, which alleged in great detail a lot of interesting facts, and that is in the public domain, this fifth amended complaint. I know because I found it on the Economist website and was part of this release, and people can read this fifth amended complaint and it is a very interesting set of allegations, I should say. Things not proven, things that were alleged that the company hoped to, to discuss in greater detail. Okay. Um, if you go, if, by the way, just as a note, if you go to any, just generally speaking, if you go look at, uh, years ago I put this together outside of the lawsuit, just looking at data from annual filings of brokerage firms, um, use the prime brokerage portion of many banks is hugely profitable mm -hmm. and it's a major source of the revenue. And you can just see that from their 10K filings for the firms that are public. Um, and that was certainly true of, of companies like uh, Goldman and Morgan and others uh, after they went public. You can break that down in their annual filings and you'll see that the prime brokerage division is a big part of their of their bottom line. Okay, so um, super interesting so far. Uh, another question we saw thematically across every platform was was how do we fix this? Um, and and I you know we talked a, a bit about that last time. Maybe let's you know, but I, I think it's a, a question worth reiterating, or 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 you know, ideas worth reiterating. You know, I, it seems to me, and and let me tell you something. Coming from now being up here in Canada, um, where you don't even have a reg show, let alone a reg show riddled with loopholes, um, it's it's even worse. 
And it's a right. huge problem both for Canadian markets where there is abusive and naked short selling and market manipulation. Um, but that's something that bleeds over to U.S. markets from Canadian markets. Um, we see it also bleed over into U.S. markets from European markets um, where you have somewhat uh, Europe has some really excellent regulation, but then there are some individual countries that have far less. Um, and all of this is being harmonized over in Europe, but it's not there yet. And so things can be can sort of just pop up in Germany, for example, and start trading and shorting and borrowing over there. Um, and that impacts the US as well. So to me, I think you we need important changes in the US and, and, and reforms to reg show, including, I would argue, getting rid of the market maker exemption entirely, the Bernie Madoff rule um, entirely from reg show. Right. Um, but, uh, and, and imposing, as, as I think we talked about before, a, a settlement discipline regime in which you have mandatory buy-ins and escalating charges for failures. Um, that seems to me step one. <laughs> but step two is it seems like you need a global solution, right? Otherwise, you're you're going to play whack-a-mole um, with this problem, and and that that seems just difficult to to envision how we can get there. First of all, Dave, I couldn't agree with you more. As as we said, I, I think it's worth repeating some things we said last time that were really good. Yeah. One is there when the treasury market had fails, they fixed it overnight. Yeah by simply imposing fines. But right. The fails went away. So fines work, yeah. Yeah. right? And every market has a clearing price, right? There's some, there's some a, a level of fine you can assess at which point fails go away. So the fact that we don't do that should tell you that the system is deeply rotten and corrupt because that's such an easy solution. You could even say, hey, fine, keep all the dem dematerialization and mobilization, <laughs> rehabilitation you want, just fine for failing. Yeah. That's the easiest solution, that's the most um, elegant solution, and it was in the original draft of Reg Show, and it was taken out. Peter Shep Cabbage, the NASA administrator, mentioned who who taught me all this, um, who was an expert on how Reg Show was was made, mm -hmm. talks about that as being the great uh, disappointment of his professional career is seeing wow. fines taken out of Reg Show because you could have avoided so much hassle on down the road. Um, the problem with centralization and unifying regimes is if you build it badly, you're simply replicating corruption and you're simply, I think, um, well, let me talk about that in context. I had huge hope for blockchain settlement. I had huge hope that we had this new set of institutions come along. They were going to have immutability. They were going to have, um, this giant ledger that people could share, they don't have to trust each other to trade on this ledger, and that somehow this would be fixed. What happened was nothing. Mm -hmm. And in some situations worse than nothing, uh, you may recall Blythe Masters from JP Morgan, she left JP Morgan, yeah. she went to Thank Australia, yeah. to the ASX, yeah. to build a blockchain settlement regime. And, 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 and that was R3, I think, right? And exactly. And they, they ended up abandoning blockchain. <laughs> they abandoned it and this, they wrote it off. The 100, 200 million that they spent almost, they wrote it off. And the CEO had to make of, of, the, Austri of the ASX made public apology saying, I'm so sorry that happened. We'll never try that again. Right. Almost it was if it was set up to fail. So I know of this, sadly, this was the moment. This was our chance yeah. to bring attention to this matter and with this new tech this shiny new toy you know a, pro a solution in search of problems well here's a problem and again i said last time yes you have the fat finger problem the immutability problem um all of those things are things that could be fixed but candidly unless you unless you change there are so many people who benefit from the current system existing as it is I mean, entire institutions, the yeah. whole share registrar system, the whole transfer agent system could all be could replaced with a computer. We could be replaced with my computer that I'm on right now. All that could be done off of my computer. And so they 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 act like they're, they're the high priests of this holy temple. And without them, you know, the world would cease to exist. But the truth is the whole system is built in 1970s technology. It will not be changed. I'm very, I'm very, pes I'm more pessimistic now than I was before. Mm. because you would you would need tremendous motivation. It would require an amendment to the Securities Act, 
uh, I think you'd have to do a new round of amendments. And that happened in the 80s, it happened in the 90s, but I think you need a new round of amendments to really change. And at this point, DTCC is arguably one of the most powerful organizations in the entire US financial system. DTCC prides themselves on clearing over a quadrillion worth of trades every year. And they used to be in lower Manhattan, now they're in New Jersey after Katrina because some of the yeah. stock certificates got wet, so they moved over there. And last I checked, it was uh, probably more heavily guarded than Fort Knox. And this is a building that just, they're, they, and they're owned, DTCC is owned by, of course, all the big broker dealers. Right. And this, any time that you try to reform this system, they go to policymakers and they say, it's like firemen when you try to cut the budget in the local city budget. Maybe you don't need that extra fire truck. Well, they say, well, babies will die. Well, if you, anytime you try to reform the stock settlement system, they talk about lack of liquidity. They talk about lack of trust in the system, capital flight. So it's very, very hard to build a constituency to oppose those who are benefit from the system and who are entrenched in the system. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna leave this even more cynical than when we came in, but Sorry we're gonna keep that. trying. No, but I mean, it's it's there's nothing more important than understanding the current system, understanding who benefits from it, understanding their arguments, and you're never going to be able to change it right. until you do. Let me let me actually end with a blue pill. So we should end on a blue a blue pill. Okay. I think that's important. Um, the uh, maybe maybe not a blue pill, maybe a white pill. Uh, that's the that's the way to go. the The white pill is retail options trading has made a whole bunch of people aware of this system that weren't aware of it before. You know, when Robin Hood said to their GameStop people, "You can't trade GameStop." Yeah. Suddenly, people understood. Wait a minute, what's wrong with this system? Yeah. How when can you Vlad take away this buy button? How is that even possible? How, and this, so there are, there's a whole generation of people understanding the bizarreness of this world who who say who understand gaslighting is bad, and who saw you know the CEO of Robinhood on TV talking about DTCC because he has essentially a kind of a credit extended him by the clearinghouse, and the clearinghouse was saying to him, these things are happening, and we're going to have to. To put an end to it so I, that's the white pill is people are talking about it we're having these conversations we're bringing awareness the next step is somehow you know uh, there needs to be organization organization helps uh charismatic leaders help like yourself dave like you paying charismatic leaders but bringing attention to these important topics and because it isn't it isn't in any of the books behind me yeah. none of the stuff right. that we're talking about is in any of these books um, it's it's like we have this oral history, like we're Aborigines walking through the outback <laughs> with this oral history of where the watering holes are. And so we're all trying to, you know, I'm telling you guys, you're telling others, this is where the watering holes are. We have to keep the oral history going. We have to write it down. And hopefully maybe somebody writes a book about it. Let's hope. I think this has been great, John. Thank you so much. Thank again. you for having me. Um, and I don't know, how can there not be a part three? Because it just seems like there's <laughs> always so much to talk about. Absolutely. Yeah. My pleasure. All right. Well, Thank you so much, John. Yeah. Make sure you guys like and subscribe. Share this video with anyone who might be interested, which I have a feeling most of you are. So uh, this was a great conversation. We appreciate the, the Greater Irvin community for providing these questions for us. And uh, we look forward to the next conversation. So go ahead and drop your questions for the next time uh, down in the comments, and we'll be sure to include it the next time we welcome John on. So thank you again, John, for joining us. Thanks, Dave. And uh, we will see you guys next time. Take yeah, care. Thanks, thanks a lot. Listening.